Welcome to the third of a series of videos from Chapter 6, Section 1, Subsection 2. The topic of this video is shaping the beam cross-section for purposes of decking. This image shows plywood decking a three-quarter inch in, in thickness being nailed down to solid sawn wood beams. Three-quarter inch plywood or oriented strand board can span up to about 24 inches between support choice. <clears throat> it's inherent in the nature of the material that it has to span however far it has to span laterally in order to um, support the load and not leave openings. So it inherently is wide and fairly shallow and its depth is determined uh, for purposes of strength in terms of shear, moment stress, and deflection. And typically in the case of wood, about a three-quarter inch thickness is good for spanning on floors up to about two feet. If we want to span further than that, we need something deeper. In the case of wood, we can laminate some standard dimension lumber together. These are what we call one inch boards. Nominally, they are cut close to one inch. They're dried or in a kiln or air dried. Then they're planed down. And in this case, for example, the nominal three inch laminated decking is basically two and three sixteenths by the time we're done because these boards are planed down to about three quarters of an inch thick. They're laminated together and then they're planed again. So nominal three inch is actually two and three sixteenths. You'll notice they're offset relative to each other to produce a tongue and groove effect similar to what we often put into floorboards. We have uh, standard three quarter inch floorboards that are tongue and groove um, normally those boards are no longer regarded as structural. They're finished boards that rest on top of some kind of subflooring, like plywood, for example. This laminated decking is typically used in conjunction with uh, glue lamb, and it's considered visual grade material, so we normally don't cover it over with something like uh, sheetrock or other finishing materials. Now it turns out that a three quarter inch thick piece of plywood, as we mentioned, will span about two feet as floor decking. If we decided to use steel sheet material instead, we have this ironic situation that because the stress capacity of steel is so high and its density is very high, if we came up with a steel sheet that had the same weight per square foot as this plywood, it would only be about uh, an eighth of an inch thick or less and that would deflect tremendously under load. So steel requires that we do something with it to make it a suitable decking material and what we do is we corrugate it. So here you see a roofing assembly with a corrugated steel deck that's on top of the top cord of a roof truss and then on top of that is rigid foam insulation, a recovery board, and a waterproof membrane. The steel decking can be typically, it can be as low as an inch thick. Uh, usually we use either inch and a half, two inch, or three inch thick decking. Over here I've summarized some loads. When we count the weight of the membrane, the recovery board, the rigid foam, and the steel decking, we only end up with about six pounds per square foot. And this three pounds per square foot for the steel is towards the high end. Normally it's substantially less than that. We usually throw in also some mechanical load and suspended ceiling, which on average ends up being about a pound per square foot. So when we add all that up, um, without considering the weight of the joist, we're at eight pounds a square foot. When we throw the joist in, it's closer to 10 pounds a square foot. In many applications, such as uh, North Carolina state jobs, 
um, we're required to also include 10 pounds a square foot of as yet undetermined future dead load that might be imposed. So even though this ends up around 10 pounds a square foot, in our analysis for gravity loads we usually make it about 20. On the other hand, the reality is it's actually very low, like 8 or 10 pounds a square foot. The uplift forces from wind can be easily double that or near the coast quadruple that. So we really have to worry about this roof flying away. So anchoring the roof down is a crucial part of the design. This corrugated decking on a roof almost never has concrete on it unless we intend to make that roof in some future date a floor or unless we're trying to ballast the roof, which we might do in high wind situations, but we almost never do that. So in a roofing configuration, it's almost always rigid insulation, insulation resting on top or, excuse me, attached to this corrugated decking. So the corrugated decking looks like this. It's smooth. This happens to be one and a half inch. Uh, the corrugated decking is designed so these sheets nest around each other so it's possible on a single truck to bring huge areas of this corrugated decking, transporting it in a very efficient manner because uh, in essence this is solid steel um, or at least 50% solid steel when all these things are nested into each other. This is what that looks like in a roofing application. So I'm showing this so you can see that this decking is generally smooth and it gets welded down to the top of the roof support structure. And while I'm here, I'm gonna mention, this is another example of a beam. In this case, we don't wanna cantilever out the entire uh, roof, open web roof joist. So we double up the depth of the top cord. So here the top cord is an angle at this point we have another angle welded to it inverted relative to it so we're creating back-to-back -back channels five inches deep which are cantilevering out about six feet so that beam is anchored back into this truss at key locations so that it's not you don't want to just attach it here because then it'll bend the top cord and the web of the truss, so it needs to be carried back in at least past one of these crucial joints. So this is what roof decking looks like. This is another support under a corner at uh, an outrigger, so in this case this member going out and supporting the corner has been made a five inch deep wide flange beam which has the same depth as the end bearing assembly for the trusses these two beams are only marginally connected at that point. We didn't want to bother doing a moment connection because there's not much to connect to. And so they're supported by these outrigger struts. Now this roof decking, as I mentioned, you can get it in various depths. The common ones being one and a half inch, two inch, and three inch. And I've just shown a couple of cut sheets here showing the profile for inch and a half. So the 1.5 here stands for inch and a half. Uh, the three stands for three inch deep corrugated decking. You can get one and a half, two and three inch deep decking, 36 inches wide and up to 42 feet long. Um, you can go to four and a half six, seven and a half, and ten inch deep corrugations. They generally are much more expensive, but they only come in one foot widths as opposed to three foot widths, and that tends to drive up the price. All corrugated decking, uh, almost always, is used uh, as a diaphragm but whether it is or not it has to be uh, either welded or nailed to the top of the support structure in this case you're looking at puddle welds someone comes along stands on the decking to hold it firmly down and welds right through the decking down into the beam it can also be nailed with super high strength nails 
which literally can drive all the way through a flange of a beam of this sort. So this is showing the connection at one of the edges of this decking. In addition to this smooth roof decking, we can also do corrugated floor decking. In this case, the key thing I want you to notice is the concrete gets poured on top of this decking. There's always some kind of wire reinforcing, which may be supplemented by rebar in critical situations or in situations where people are just really concerned about avoiding unsightly cracks. What I want you to notice is this curious embossing pattern, which you see on the floor decking and you don't see on roof decking. The embossing assures a shear connection at the interface with the concrete. So when the concrete is poured, it oozes between this embossing and that assures that it can't slide relative to this. So once the decking, once the concrete is cured, the deck works by the concrete being in compression and the corrugated decking being in tension. Before the concrete cures, the decking has to carry all of the load. So it often turns out to be the case that the governing design criterion for this decking is its strength in supporting the green concrete while the concrete is in the process of curing. So we go from this interesting situation where we have compression in the top part, tension in the bottom part while the concrete is curing, but once the concrete is hard and we add more load, all of this decking can work in tension and the concrete basically carries the compression. One of the interesting consequences of that is that used in that mode, this decking becomes effectively always simple span because anywhere we get stress reversal, the concrete tends to crack. And so we simple span from support point to support point. This shows what those corrugations, or the, the embossing rather, looks like. So here we have the corrugated flute. Here's the sides of the flute with the embossing there and there. In this case, the decking has, been st has come to a girder, or a, uh, yes, in this case a girder. It's welded down at the edges there, and then the next piece of decking starts off from there. So the continuity of this decking from a diaphragm point of view is through this beam that's supporting it. This is a view from down below showing the embossing pattern. And here's another view of that type of decking. In this case, I should showed this view because you'll notice these struts that go from the top of this beam to the bottom of that beam. This is a perimeter beam. It's going to have something called bypass studs on it. When the wind blows on those studs, it's going to tend to put this beam in torsion. As we've learned already, I-beams are really poor in torsion. And so to stabilize this beam, we have a series of struts that take the bottom flange of that beam up to the top flange of this beam. And subsequently, those forces go into the decking. And that's what helps stabilize this beam against torquing over under those forces. Now we'd often like to use the decking as part of our beam. In other words, the decking would go on the top of this beam, and I apologize for this picture. This beam was delivered to the site and is lying on the ground, and I've photographed it and turned it upward to show the orientation the beam will ultimately have. Um, that decking is spanning between this beam and the next beam over. Um, but that decking is not fully utilized, and if we can engage the decking as part of this beam, then it can actually improve the performance. In fact, if the decking comes up six inches above here, for example, the effective depth can be made from up there to down there. So the way we achieve that is we put these headed shear studs and they're called welded headed shear studs and you may hear them referred to as shear pins or Nelson studs but the correct name is welded headed shear studs and they are welded to this beam and when the concrete is poured
these studs assure that the concrete can't slip relative to the top flange of this beam. When this photograph was taken, the standard procedure for this was to weld these studs to the beam in the factory. Then the decking would have holes in it and the decking would get dropped down over these studs and then the concrete would get poured. And by the way, after the decking was dropped down, it would also be welded to the top of the beam to assure that it also was not slipping relative to the beam. These uh, studs created problems in terms of the patterning of holes in the decking and getting everything lined up properly, but aside from that, these studs were traced to a number of uh, accidents on construction jobs where people tripped on these studs. And so the decision was made, rather than to pre-weld them, that in fact the studs would be welded on after the decking was put in place. This is against the trend that we've mentioned of trying not to weld on the site any more than necessary. However, the process for welding these studs has been really well worked out so that the environmental conditions that normally exist on the site don't undermine the quality of them. So this decking was put on. It was spot welded down, as you can see right here. And then after the fact, these studs were welded on, and then finally this wire mesh was put on. This is called welded wire, and we almost always put it in for shrinkage purposes to minimize cracks. But in general, it's desirable to make the concrete as strong as possible. This shows a pattern of shear studs on a girder, or in this case, actually, it's a, something called a drag strut, which is on top of a girder. Um, these are very sturdy studs, and then there are secondary studs along here that connect to the tops of the joists. So there's a joist there and a joist out there, or in other words, filler beams or secondary beams. Now, anywhere this wire mesh uh, terminates, uh, rather than wire it to some other mesh, we just create overlaps. So right here we're looking at an overlap point for four different pieces of, of welded wire mesh or intersecting. And I'm just showing that as a sort of maximum density condition that you might uh, observe. Here's a perimeter situation where there's a beam along here. These welds are to the edge angle. And so the concrete is actually cantilevering from there out to there. And it doesn't look like it in this image, but this cantilever is about a foot and a half. And you just can't cantilever it in that way because then the concrete will be in tension because the concrete is on the top of this slab construction. The steel is on the bottom, but also the steel corrugations are not running in the correct direction. So you just can't cantilever off here carelessly. So in this case, you'll notice these straps that come back with a hook on them. Those straps are to create the tensile capability to allow this little foot and a half long cantilever to occur beyond this beam. So the foot and a half cantilever is in that direction. And this is the tensile steel, which will be near the top of that slab. Now this is a view of the classic edge angle that we use to contain the concrete. Um, in this case, there, this is a corner condition where all this has been welded together. So decking will land on this edge angle and land on that edge angle. And at the moment, we don't know exactly the direction of those corrugations, but presumably the corrugations might terminate right at there and then run parallel to this face of this edge angle. Uh, here's another example of an edge angle. Here these little cantilevers have been established which are supporting an edge angle out at this point here. That edge angle sits on the primary beam and then you'll notice this decking comes over and rests on that edge angle. That reinforces that edge but also provides uh, some definition to the thickness of the slab at that point while they're pouring it. This shows an edge angle on an interior opening, in this case a hydraulic elevator shaft. Uh, 
but it could be a, a floor, an, excuse me, a stair shaft or something like that. But the idea is the concrete needs to come to this edge and stop. So you see the welds for that edge angle resting on top of the girder down below. Uh, this is what that looks like from the inside. So here you see that edge angle being supported on these beams and then this is what it looks like after the concrete's been poured so there's a lot of concrete that is slopped over on this beam but you can still see from the rust along here that that's actually edge angle steel uh, that has just uh, become covered um, with concrete this shows the condition around the column and you'll notice some patching has been done to keep the concrete from oozing through and this is what something like that would look like after the concrete's been poured. On slabs, we often put a diamond shape cut out of the concrete here with some kind of expansion joint to minimize cracking. But in this case, the roof diaphragm has, I mean the floor diaphragm has got to frame into this joint. And so the concrete has been run continuously in there. That might cause some cracking to occur, but that's mainly a visual issue. And a lot of times it gets covered up by whatever is used to encase this column for fireproofing and visual purposes. Now, one of the things that needs to be pointed out is that these steel beams have to be fireproofed. Uh, we don't typically fireproof the decking, and the theory behind that is that the decking is attached directly to enough concrete that that concrete provides some thermal mass and slows down the rate at which the uh, temperature of that deck increases. But these beams are a bit more isolated and exposed and they have to be fireproofed. In this case some fireproofing was attached and then got torn partially out because the construction got modified but all of these beams would be fully covered with this fireproofing before they're done. Now, there's one other kind of decking you should be aware of. It's called cellular decking, where you start basically with corrugated decking and you take a flat plate on the bottom or a flat sheet and press them together and uh, tack weld them along the line. So. Uh, this decking for a given th thickness, or depth rather, is stronger than just the corrugated decking by itself. It also uh, can be treated with perforations and filled with insulation. That's not for thermal purposes, that's for acoustic purposes. It gets short-circuited by all this metal around it, so it would be useless, pretty much useless for thermal purpose purposes but it does help for acoustic purposes. It also means that the lower surface of that material becomes the finished ceiling. Um, so this decking tends to be more expensive uh, and you can get it in both roof tech decking forms and in uh, floor decking versions. And again you notice for roof decking it's smooth and then there's this embossing pattern which allows it to work in composite action with the concrete that's poured on top of it. Now we have talked about the whole idea of steel I-beams working in composite action with a concrete deck and we've mentioned the problems in making that happen. For example, shear studs have to be welded to the top of the beam. Then the concrete has to be field welded, excuse me, uh, poured in place in the field and then the steel has to be fireproofed. In the case of concrete, we have a technique where the deck and the beam are cast as an integral unit. So in this case, we call this a double T. This particular one being showed is 12 feet wide and 34 inches deep. Um, there's lots of reinforcing steel at the bottom of this stem or rib and then the concrete at the top is the prime compression element. Um, it's a very nice integrated system um, with composite action between the decking and the stem. Um, 
and it's all precast, so it gets delivered to the site uh, without the necessity for pouring concrete in the site. This one, by the way, is called pre-topped, which I think is really a very confusing name. It just means that it comes with a four inch thick flange on the top and uh, the flanges get welded together with using steel inserts at these edges so that you get diaphragm action out of your floor or roof. Um, this is to be distinguished from a version which uh, has a thinner flange in that case only two inches and then there is a field applied surface. If you want to have carpet and a smooth floor you have to have this because there will be a certain amount of camber in these things and if you start with this they won't line up perfectly at that edge and your carpet will get creases in it. This is typically used in parking decks where the top diversion is more often used in buildings. And one of the reasons that this is preferred in parking decks is that the field applied topping is of inferior quality to the factory cast uh, double T. And in situations like parking decks where the double T is exposed to freeze thaw cycles and uh, more abuse, um, it's generally preferred to avoid this topping layer. This is a point at which I'll make a philosophical statement which is a matter of opinion and might not be uh, corroborated in reality, but this system seems extremely attractive to me um, especially in situations where you're not putting carpet directly on this top surface but you might have pedestals that support an access floor. So a version of this type to be used in buildings is very attractive. It's also attractive to use the pedestals with the access floor because this system tends to have a fair amount of camber. That's due to the fact that high strength steel cable is used in the bottom when the cable tension is released, it causes the, um, the uh, double T to develop a crown or something that um, we call a camber, which is to be distinguished between camphor, by the way. In these numbers, you'll notice the second number has to do with the camber at erection the other has to do with estimated long-term camber. So some of these cambers are fairly significant, like at a 52-foot span here, we've got uh, over two inches of camber, and down here we've got over two and a half. So this is kind of a rolling floor, and we have some discontinuities here. All that lack of smoothness can be taken out by an access floor. The other thing that I think that the precast people have done, which may be a disservice to themselves, is they have continually tried to thin down the stem as much as possible on the theory that this material is not that helpful, uh, at least from a strength point of view. What happens though is, is this stem gets thinner when the steel is released and it throws all that force into the bottom of the stem there's not enough concrete there to resist the deformation and that produces more camber than you would like. I think that in the process of thinning down this stem, the precast folks have tended to cater to least first cost markets like parking decks and they may have done that at the expense of higher end building applications. And I know back in the uh, earlier days of double T's, they did versions where the stem was thicker at the base and there was less deflection and they tended to be visually much more appealing. And so I think it would be great if the precast industry went back and re-examined their policy on that because this integrated system is wonderful compared to steel. In the, in the, as I mentioned, in steel, you have to weld the shear studs onto the top. You have to pour the concrete in the field. Uh, 
and then you have to fireproof the steel and when you're done the steel is not used to optimal efficiency because the top flange of the steel is not working very well in compression once that compressive burden gets transferred over to the concrete flange at the top. This issue, by the way, of too much camber is partially addressed in what we call a hollow core plank. In this case, rather than have slender stems come down, they've extruded this shape where there's extra material on the bottom to resist the inward pull of those um, steel cables when the cables are released and the force of the cables is put into the concrete. So typically, hollow core planks for a given depth can span further than double T's. Key wording there is for a given depth. Uh, hollow core planks are hard to uh, produce at too much depth because they're actually extruded out of a very stiff concrete and if you make them too deep or these holes are too large the concrete begins to, begins to slump and deform. So if you're looking for long spans Double T's are still, still work better because they are cast in formwork. That ends our video on shaping the beam cross section for decking.